start. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for being here. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, more Harcourt Balter, who will be giving uh, today's uh, SNAP seminar. Uh, she's the Bruce J. Nelson Professor of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Moore is a fellow of both ACM and IEEE. She's a recipient of the Mac Andlis Junior Chair, the NSF Career Award, and very many uh, teaching awards. She's also uh, the recipient of dozens of industrial faculty awards uh, from Google, Microsoft, IBM, uh, Yahoo, and so on. Uh, she's heavily involved in, both in the Sigmetrics and Performance Research Community, and she's received uh, many uh, paper awards there. She's also the author of a popular textbook, and I just learned another textbook is also uh, uh, fresh off the oven, and it's going to be out soon. Uh, so thanks so much more for being here. It's our pleasure to have you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking Ruba, who's been very patient um, in dealing with me, and thanking Yuan, who also answered a bunch of my questions. I'm very happy to be here. I, my name is Moore Harkel Balter. I'm coming from the Computer Science Department at Carnegie Mellon University. And this talk is based on the thesis work of my student, Isaac Grossoff. And as Ruba mentioned, I have a textbook on queuing theory. So if you like the style of the talk, you might want to look at the textbook. So I'm going to be talking about queuing models for today's compute centers. And whoops. OK, let's try this again. All right. So I've been measuring compute jobs for a very long time. So back in 1996, I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, and I was measuring Unix jobs. And you can read about it in this paper. And now, 25 years later, I'm still measuring jobs. This time, I'm measuring jobs at Google Borg's data center. And there's a lot of differences between the jobs over the course of 25 years. But the most pronounced difference is that back in 1996, the jobs I was measuring each ran on just a single core. And in 2020, the jobs that I'm dealing with each run on multiple cores simultaneously. And this is really the point of this talk, is that we as queuing theorists need to adapt our models to account for the fact that a job now spans multiple cores, in fact, many cores. So if you look more closely at this 2020 work and you look at the trace, you'll see that a job might be requesting just one core, but there are also jobs that request 10 to the fifth cores. So there's huge variability in the number of cores that jobs request. And we refer to a job that requests multiple cores as a multi-server job. That's just the name we're gonna give it. So a multi-server job is a job that has two components. There's a server need, a number of servers, and a duration. So if you look here, for instance, we have a server need of four and then a duration of seven hours. And the point here is that the job is going to hold on to the four servers, the all four servers for the whole seven hours. So when we talk about the size of a job, and this is gonna be really important throughout the talk. When we talk about the size of a job, we're really looking at server need multiplied by duration. So for instance, in this case, it's four cores times seven hours or 28 core hours. So when I say here size, I really am talking about work associated with a job, like how many core hours you need. So that's, those are the units of size here. And you might've noticed I'm using core and server synonymously. Okay, I'm gonna keep doing that because in queuing we say server, but I'm really talking about the core. Okay, so this job is 28 core hours, that's its size. Okay, so now when I talk about a multi-server job model, I'm talking about jobs arriving over time. So here's a, a job with server need two, and now a job with server need four arrives, and now a job with server need one arrives. Next, the job with server need four arrives, but you see it can't fit. So we're leaving this one server down here idle because the job can't fit. And even though more jobs arrive after my job, they too can't get into the system. Even this job back here 
that needs that has a server need of one wouldn't be allowed in under a scheduling policy like first come first serve. Okay, we're just going to leave the server on. So I'm now going to talk a little bit more precisely about this multi-server job model. So throughout, I'm going to use K for the number of servers. So they're K servers and their jobs arriving over time. And each arrival is class I with probability PI. And each arrival requests, each arrival of class I requests NI servers and holds onto them for XI time. So this NI times XI, remember, is the size or work associated with the job. And so this expression here is the load row. And so we have NI times E of XI, this is the size or work associated with the job. And then there's the arrival rate of the job. And the K is how many, how much can be done, how much work can be done per hour, okay, per unit time. So this is load, this expression is load. And now one might ask, well, is this system stable for all load less than one? That's normally what we think about in queuing theory. And the answer for this system is no, it is not stable for all load less than one. And the reason is because you can have a server or multiple servers that are idle, even though there is a huge amount of work in the system. So there's a lot of work in the system, but these servers are still idle. So we're not reaching the full stability region. So it turns out that these multi-server job models are actually really poorly understood, even though they're so common. So with respect to stability, we can compute the stability of a multi-server job model for a particular instance, you know, a particular Lambda and K and stuff, but it's not known in closed form for general K, unless all the durations here, the X sub I's, are the same exponential with rate mu. And this is work by Rumiansev, who has done really beautiful work in this area. But basically, I consider stability to still be an open area. Okay, we just don't know how to solve it. And then when you come to the thing we really care about, which is response time, that's even more open. So there have been quite a few papers and even a thesis, okay? But basically, it's limited to two servers only, okay? And even that's really hard. So we also don't understand response time for first come first serve. Um, so this is also open. So you might ask, well, what are people doing? <laughs> okay, if we can't do stability and we can't do response time. So what people do is they look for policies that do achieve the full stability region. Okay, so the work is on something we call throughput optimality. So we say that a policy pi is throughput optimal if it achieves the full stability region. So for instance, first come first serve is clearly not throughput optimal, okay? Because it leaves servers idle. There are several attempts to be throughput optimal. So backfilling is this idea where you can take a job, you know, some job maybe from further back in the queue and run it, like make it jump ahead of this four, four server job over here and let it jump ahead. That's the idea in backfilling, okay? Um, unfortunately, we don't understand the throughput and backfilling very well at all, okay? But it's one idea. A different idea for increasing the, for increasing the stability region is to use something very intuitive called most servers first. So this is something that you do like when you're packing your suitcase. And when you're packing your suitcase, you basically always try to throw in the biggest item first so that you keep, you know, so you utilize your suitcase best, you put in your big boots. So here, we basically preemptively at all times, whenever a new job arrives or jobs complete, we preemptively always try to put in the biggest job, the job with the highest server needs. So that would be the blue job here. And we try to pack that blue job, okay? At all times, we preemptively pack our largest server need first. And that's great, okay? Um, that also increases throughput. Doesn't always get the highest throughput, but it definitely increases throughput. And finally, there is a policy called max weight. And this policy has actually been proven to be throughput optimal. So this is work by Magluri and Shrikant and Ying. And the way max weight works is it's a very complicated policy. That's why I'm saying it's a little impractical. 
It's a complicated policy. At every moment in time, whenever jobs arrive or leave, you consider all possible packings, all different packings that you could have. And then for every packing, you assign a weight to it. So, and that weight is based on the number of jobs in the system. So you take, for instance, the number of yellow jobs that you've packed, and you look at the number of yellow jobs in the system and weight it by that. And then the number of red jobs gets weighted by the number of red jobs in the system. And you pick the packing that has the maximum weight, okay, out of all the packings. And that turns out to be throughput optimal. But the real point that I want to make in the slide is that for every one of these policies, and in fact, for every policy that I know, the response time is not understood. We just don't know how to think about response time. So the point of this talk is going to be, can we think about response time? So our goal, we would like to have some policy pi, which ideally is throughput optimal, so it achieves the full stability region and has some predictable mean response time and is super simple, okay? So that's what we're looking for in this, in this talk. So the talk, the, the work that I'm gonna talk about is really very new. Um, so this is papers from 2022 and a paper that hasn't even quite yet appeared in 23. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first start by introducing a new policy server filling. Server filling is very much like first come first serve, except for what we do at the very front of the queue. Okay, but otherwise it, it behaves very much in the in a first come first serve kind of way. So I'm going to introduce that policy and then I'm going to describe the first mean response time bounds. And this is significant just because there are no response time bounds for any of these policies. So this is one where we can now analyze. And finally, I'm gonna ask, is it possible to actually be even more ambitious and get to the optimal response time? Can we do something like that? Now, when talking about these things, there are gonna be some caveats. So the first caveat here is when I talk about server filling, I'm gonna assume that the number of servers K is a power of two and all server needs are also powers of two. And this is something that's very common in computer science, like everything is a power of two, okay? But I'm gonna need to make that assumption. It turns out that I can actually relax that assumption by using a slightly different policy to allow all server needs to just divide the number of servers K, okay? But the policy I'm gonna talk about is the power of two one. And then when I talk about response time bounds, I'm also gonna have a caveat. So here I'm going to assume that we have something called bounded expected remaining size. So if you remember here, SI is the size of class I jobs. And this quantity here is the expected remaining size. So given that the size exceeds A, this is what's left over. So this is expected remaining size. And if I consider the soup of all of these, that's gonna be a quantity I'm gonna call REM soup. So it's the soup of all the expected remaining sizes. And what I'm gonna need is that this REM soup is finite. So in case you're wondering, like this is, this is a pretty reasonable assumption in the sense that all phase type distributions, for instance, have finite REM soup. And um, a bounded parade or any bounded distribution has finite REM soup, okay? So I'm gonna need that assumption. And this, these first two results appeared in a paper with um, Alan Scheller-Wolf, whom I just saw a second ago, and with Isaac Rosoff. Um, and so this is a paper in Cuesta 2022. After we do that, we're gonna move to the heavy traffic optimality where we're gonna need a different assumption, which is something akin to finite variance, okay? A little bit stronger than finite variance. And that will be appearing in a paper, same authors, in Sigmetrics 2023, it'll appear next month. Okay, so let's get to it. We're gonna do the first part. And at the end of each part, I'm gonna ask to see if you have any questions. Okay, so all I'm gonna do in this part is introduce server filling. So server filling I said is very much like first come first serve. So let's talk about first come first serve first. So in first come first serve, you line up your jobs from oldest to newest. And then you basically put the jobs in, the oldest jobs into your system, okay? So our system would have this job here with the yellow job 
and then we'd put the red job in, and then we'd put the pink job in, and this is all the rest of the jobs. And this is what it would look like in first come first serve. So server filling is very similar. The only thing is we're going to take our eight servers here. So you see our eight servers, and we're going to define this thing called an M set. And an M set is the minimal prefix of jobs, the minimal prefix, which collectively require that at least eight servers. So in this case, the M set would be this. So this is two servers plus four servers is six servers, plus one is seven servers. So whoops, we had to include this too, to be over eight servers. So this is an M set. All the rest of the jobs stay the same, okay? It's all first come first serve basically, okay? All, everything stays in order except for this M set. What we're gonna do is we're gonna fill our servers from the M set. But when we fill from the M set, instead of going oldest first, we're gonna fill highest server need first. So when I'm filling my servers from the M set, I would first put in the two red jobs because they have the highest server need. So my solution would look like this. I would put in my two red jobs. That's what I would put in because I'm filling from my M set. Okay, high server need first. And then I have my other two jobs in my M set. This is my M set here, this, this um, green. And then this is all the other jobs in the system. Okay, could be a very long queue. Now, when new jobs arrive, jobs just get added to the back of the queue, okay? So when new jobs arrive, they just get added here to the back of the queue, nothing has to change, okay? Things only change when my M set changes. So for instance, suppose one of these red jobs went away, if finished, then my M set would no longer contain this red job. In that case, I would need to grow my M set now so that my M set still contains jobs with at least eight servers. So here I'm gonna make my red job disappear, my red job disappeared, my M set grew, and now I have to adjust the jobs that are in the M set. So again, I'm taking these jobs highest server need first, and I've put them in here. And in general, at the time when a job completes, only when jobs complete, there may be preemption required, preempt resume, okay? That's the only time that preemption might be needed here is when the M set changes. Okay, so otherwise this policy looks a lot like first come first serve, okay? But there's a big difference between this and first come first serve. And the big difference is that for this kind of a policy, when the M set is full, provided I have at least, at least enough jobs to cover eight servers, okay? At least eight servers worth of jobs, when the M set is full, all K servers are full. So I'm not ending up with idle servers. So if you want to think about it, there's a proof to this, okay? But this is where I use that power of two idea, okay? To be able to ensure that all the servers are full. And because the servers are full, whenever the M set is full, whenever there's at least K jobs, for instance, in the system, because of that, we can say that server filling achieves the full stability region, okay? And so it's throughput optimal, okay? So, so this is a ve the very, very important property that we're going to need. All right, so I will be doing, I will be showing you the mean response time and everything. I'll show you how to drive it for server filling, but it helps to start just by looking at simulation results because I think it, it explains what's really going on here. So here I've tried to create a really, really simple workload. So we have K servers, that's eight servers, and we only have two job types. There's the pink jobs, which have server need one, and the blue jobs with server need eight. And two thirds of the jobs are gonna be pink and one third are gonna be blue. And all the durations are gonna be exponential with rate one, just to keep things simple. So what I, what I want to say here is just that the pink jobs basically have a size which is one, remember size is number of servers times duration. So they have size one and the blue job has mean size eight, okay? So pink jobs have mean size one, blue jobs have mean size eight. Now let's look at mean response time as a function of load. 
So first come first serve looks very bad. You can see that we don't even get up here to this high load. And the reason is that in first come first serve, what's happening is these ser one server jobs, the pink jobs are coming in. And once you have a couple pink jobs or, or even one pink job, no blue job can come in. So if you just have a few pink jobs, you could end up with most of your servers completely idle, okay? And you can't let in a blue job. Server filling takes care of this because server filling always takes the jobs from the M set in the largest server need first. So it would swap those jobs. And so you see server filling is great because it achieves the full load, okay? So now let's look at most servers first. Most servers first is actually throughput optimal in the setting of the power of two, okay? But it doesn't look as good. It doesn't look as good as server filling. And the reason is because most servers first is biasing always preemptively. It's always preemptively choosing to run the blue jobs. And by doing that, it's running jobs of a larger size. And for those of you who've heard my many talks, we all know running largest size first is not good. We want to run smallest size first. Okay. So that's why most servers first doesn't always look so good, even though it's very intuitive. And finally, we have the max weight policy. Now, the max weight policy is provably throughput optimal. It's like great. Okay. But it only really looks good under high load. When you look at low load, the Q length is short. And the problem with that is that we don't know how to figure out those weights reliably. Remember, the whole idea in max weight is figuring out the packing that has the maximum weight. And we're not getting a good enough signal on how to weight packings when the Q length is short. And that's why max weight isn't so good. So server filling looks very, very good. And what I'm gonna do in the next part of the talk now that we have finished introducing server filling is talk about how to get its mean response time. So I'd like to stop and take at least one question quickly before I go to mean response time. I'm happy to put this back here. Anybody wanna ask me about server filling, how server filling works? I do. Um, you were about sl slide 17 and I never understood what's gonna happen with a blue job. Like at some point in your end yeah. set, the blue job is gonna come in. And here's my question. Um, will you keep servers empty because you have to put the blue job or will you continue expanding that M set and putting all the small jobs? So how will the blue job make it? Perfect. Let's talk about it, Maria. Let's do it, okay? So the point is the, the servers are never empty, okay? Servers are not kept empty unless the M set is not full, but, but the M set will be full here. Let's pretend, let's assume that this red job down here disappears. So if the red job disappears, now my M set feels really under full, right? Because I have two plus one is three plus two is five, okay? So clearly once this red job disappears, I need to grow my M set. So I will grow to first include this, but that only brings me to seven. That's not good enough. So my M set will actually grow to include the blue job with everybody else, okay? So once this red job leaves, the M set will include everything, including this big blue job. And the moment that that happens, so these all happen at the same time, right? The M job leaves, the M set grows to include the blue job. And then we have to fill from the M set in order of highest server need first. So who's gonna go into service? Has to be blue, but it doesn't fit. The blue does fit, it's eight servers. All right, so but what happens at the other two yellow ones? Out, Everybody else will be preempted out and the blue okay. job will come in. It's the preemption that I was missing. That's yeah. what I was talking about when I said preemption. You, you hit the nail on the head. Thank you. Okay, so we need that preemption in the same way that like most servers first or max weight, all of these policies assume preemption. Okay, so pre they assume a preempt resume. Um, and that's important to be able to keep throughput optimality. <laughs> Otherwise we're not gonna get throughput optimality and then we're gonna be back in this horrible case of like first come first serve, okay? Where we're just not achieving what we should be achieving. Okay, so let me continue now with the analysis of mean response time. All right, so the key idea to analyze the server filling 
is to relate the server filling system to an MG1, a simple MG1 first come first serve. So on the left here, I have server filling and you can see it's a nice looking server filling system. And on the right, I have an MG1 with a very big fat server. And what I'm trying to convey here is I'm going to view these servers here on the left as each operating at a very slow speed, one over K. So they're each operating at speed one eight, okay? And this server over here is operating at speed one. And the whole point here is at first it seems impossible. Like this seems so powerful because this, you know, with a single job, it can run at a full speed one, right? And it seems very, very powerful. But the point is that this system can look like this system. The left can look like the right, given that I'm always keeping all these servers busy. If I'm always keeping these servers busy, okay, whenever there's enough work, then I'm basically operating like one big fat server. So I'm now going to make this precise. Okay. So remember on the left here, a job consists of a server need V and a duration X. And now we're gonna talk about the size of a job. So remember, this is like the work associated with the job. And in this model, because the speeds look like this, this size or work is gonna be this quantity. So V over K is the fraction of the system resources that the job is using per hour. And this is multiplied by hours. So let's be very clear here. This red job is using four out of eight of the servers. So it's using four eighths or half of the system resources per hour. And then it might be running for some number of hours. And that would be its total size or work, okay? That's how much work is associated with it. It's using four eighths times the, times the number of hours. And then of course, load is lambda times this expected work per job. So here on the right side, when I talk about size, I'm going to use the same size distribution that I got from here on the left. So whatever this size distribution in terms of the sizes of the jobs, that's what I'm gonna call the sizes of jobs here on the right, the same size distribution. And these are gonna be drawn IID from that size distribution so that the systems look the same. And then load is again, the same kind of quantity lambda times E of S. So the point is, I've got two systems. They both have the same load, okay? They both have the same job size distribution where the size of a job is like the work that each job brings in. They have the same size distribution. And then I'm simply trying to say that they're similar. Okay, so the theorem is gonna say, assuming all jobs have bounded expected remaining size, okay, bounded expected, this is this REM soup is finite, okay? Assuming that, then for all loads, we're gonna say the mean response time under server filling is very similar to the mean response time in an MG1, but it's plus or minus this constant, okay? And these constants are gonna be constants that don't depend on load. So I'm gonna bound my server filling by MG1s with constants that don't depend on load, okay? And because those constants don't depend on load, a corollary of the theorem is that when load gets high, these constants are not affected. So you can say when load gets high, the mean response time under server filling really approaches exactly the same thing as the mean response time under an MG1. The ratio of these goes to one, okay? And it's because as load gets high, the constants aren't touched, okay? So, so the point of the whole, the, the point of this whole analysis is that server filling looks like an MG1, okay? All right, so let's go see how to prove this. So the proof really has two parts. The first part, which is the part I'm gonna concentrate on, is the work under server filling looks like the work in an MG1. And that's the harder part of the proof. And then once you have that, now you just have to argue that the response time under server filling looks like the work under server filling, okay? And this constant here that I'm talking about is gonna be K minus one times REM soup, but you're gonna see where this comes up in the proof. So don't worry about it right now. So we're gonna concentrate on just this first part. I'm trying to show 
that the work in this system is equal to the work in this system, maybe plus something. So I want to analyze expected work under server filling. Okay, it's not at all obvious how do you figure out what the expected work is under server filling. So I'd like to view this like as if I'm teaching class. So when we think about work, this is the work at time T under server filling. And first you see the work dropping and it doesn't necessarily drop at rate one because maybe not all servers are full. Okay, and the reason not all servers might be full might be there just isn't that much work in the system right now. Okay, so the M set is not yet full. Okay, and now job arrives, and now work is being done at some rate, and now jobs arrive, and now work is being done at rate one, okay, and now there's nothing in the system for a while, and so on, okay? So the work is going up and down, okay? And I'm interested in the time average, the expected work. How are we going to do this? So we're going to use a rate conservation law, and the rate conservation law says the expected rate at which work decreases should equal the expected rate at work, which work increases, okay? These should be balanced, all right? So let's talk about the rate at which work decreases. So B of T is gonna denote the fraction of the capacity that I'm using at time T. Like, am I using the full capacity one? Or am I using maybe only half the capacity at time t? That's B of t. And then the rate at which the work changes with time is aside from the jumps up, the rate of the decrease part is B of t. So I'm decreasing at some rate like half or something. I might be decreasing at a rate one, okay? So that's the change in work. And here I'm looking for the rate at which work decreases, this rate, of change of work. And so that obviously time average is E of B. That's the average fraction of capacity being used, okay? So that's the average rate at which work is changing, decreasing. And the rate at which work is increasing is well, every time there's an arrival, then I get E of S work in the system, okay? S remember is like work, the size of the job. So these two quantities should be equal. But now if you think about that, you're like, wait a minute, but the expected fraction of capacity used, isn't that just rho? So all I've said here is that rho equals lambda E of S, no news yet, okay? Nothing exciting going on here. So the trick is we still wanna use the rate conservation law, but we want to somehow keep an E of W, an expected work in there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to apply the rate conservation law, not to W, but to W squared. So here's the same rate conservation law, but now I'm going to look at the rate at which W squared decreases and the rate at which W squared increases. So again, we have B of T is the fraction of capacity used at time T. We have the change in the work is that negative B of T. But this time I'm going to want the derivative of W squared. And the derivative of W squared is two times W times the rate at which W changes. So it's this quantity. So the expected rate that W squared decreases is now expected value of two WB. And the expected rate that it increases is, well, it's W squared. So when it increases, we're going from W to W plus S and W squared is going to W plus S quantity squared. That's the increase in W squared. So the rate of increase of W squared is there are this many arrivals per hour. And then this is the change in the work, the new work minus the old work. And now these two things have to be equal. Okay. So what is happening here? The whole point is that I'm going to end up with finally with some E of W terms. E of W is what I want, expected work. So after I do some algebra and move some things around, I end up finally with my E of W, okay? But you see there are also some of these other terms like this WB, it's still sitting here, okay? Because that didn't break up. So let's take a closer look at this formula. So what we've shown is that the work under server filling has two pieces. 
This first thing is something you should recognize. That's the work in an MG1, okay? That's the PK formula. But the second thing is something I'm gonna call expected waste or wasted capacity. So the way to think about the second term, and this is really important in thinking about this work, about this kind of research. If you look at it, there is work in the system, okay? But this, this quantity is referring to times when there is work in the system, but I'm not working at full capacity. If I was working at full capacity, if B was one, this would just disappear, that would be zero. So I'm looking at situations where there's work in the system, but the capacity, but, but I'm only working at maybe half capacity or something. So I'm wasting capacity. The only time this term is, is not zero is when that happens. So let's do an example, okay? Suppose you have an MG1. And an MG1, B, the fraction of time you're busy, is always either one or zero. You're either busy or you're not. And if you're busy, then the waste is zero because you have a B is one here. And if you're not busy, if B is zero, then it must be the case that work is zero. And so this whole term is zero again, so waste is zero. So in an MG1, basically all of this goes away, okay? But let's consider server filling. And server filling, B is either one, you're fully busy, okay, then waste is zero, okay? or you're not fully busy. But the only time that you're not fully busy, remember, remember, so long as the M set is full, you're fully busy, okay? The only time you're not fully busy is when the work in the system is not as much as, as, as for the M set. So the work now at this point is bounded by K minus one times remaining time of the jobs. So K, K minus one jobs, and their remaining time. That's like an upper bound would be K minus one rem soup would be an upper bound on what the, on the work that's happening there. And we can show that this, this term expected waste is actually bounded by that K minus one rem soup, which should make sense because when you're not busy, that's like wasted, okay? That's what you're wasting. And the result then is that the, work under server filling is the same as the work under an MG1 plus the C, where C is this K minus one times this kind of maximum remaining time. So this is just the bound. Okay, putting it all together, moving it back to mean response time, we can now take a look. So this, this theorem is what we proved, this is a theorem, but I'm now gonna show you what it means in terms of simulation results. So in simulation, remember before we, we had this nice workload with the pink jobs and the blue jobs, and we saw that server filling was really good on this kind of workload, okay? And other, other policies can really fail. So what our theorem is telling us is that server filling should look very much like an MG1. And in fact, when we look at the MG1, here's the MG1, and server filling looks like an MG1. And so the point here is, that we've been able to find a policy server filling, which is throughput optimal, as we've defined it, has predictable mean response time. It looks like a MG1 with um, a big server, and it's pretty simple in terms of what you do, okay? Um, what I will do in the rest of the talk is start asking about, can we obtain optimal mean response time? But first I'd like to stop and take some questions on what I've just finished, which is mean response time. Does anybody have any question on this derivation of mean response time? So I'm just gonna go back. This is it graphically, and there's a theorem, and we talked about rate conservation law. Does anybody have a question? I think the talk got a little technical. <laughs> People might not be ready to ask questions, but um, okay, talk is almost over. So we've finished discussing mean response time and how to get mean response time. I now want to simply ask, is it possible to get optimal response time? Can we do optimal? So this is the last part of the talk. So when you think about optimal in a multi-server setting, 
um, for me and my co-authors, it wasn't even op obvious what we mean by optimal. Like, what does optimal, you know, what should we be aiming for? So it's always useful when you're trying to think about optimal to think about a lower bound and ask yourself, what would be a lower bound on any policy pie, okay? And a lower bound would be, well, if all the servers could like, if I could mimic anything that any of the servers could do and have like one big super server, okay? Then that looks like a lower bound on the system on the left, okay? Except that we would want the single server to be doing the optimal thing. So that remember the single server has these job sizes, which come from the same distribution as these job sizes. And we would want the single server to be doing SRPT. Why? I mean, I always give talks on SRPT. Okay, so we always want to run the job with the shortest remaining processing time. So now the question is, can we say that there is some policy pie so that the system on the left here actually behaves like the system on the right? And we can't have behavior, we can't have this perfect behavior under all loads, we're going to say under, under as row goes to one, okay? And it seems a little bit impossible that the system on the left could behave like the system on the right, okay? Because this is really powerful, one big server running at the optimal policy. But it turns out it is true. You can actually make it behave. But it wasn't obvious to us how to do this. So we had a few candidates for opt, and they were wrong. So the first candidate was we thought we would, we would um, sort the jobs, we would rank the jobs in terms of running, we would have a policy that always favored the job with the shortest remaining duration. And this seemed really good, except that for opt, you really need to order jobs by the job's inherent work. And the job's total work is really its size, not its duration. Okay, remember size is the product. So then we said, okay, no problem. We should, we should order the jobs by shortest remaining size and we should always run the job with the shortest remaining size. That sounds really good, okay? That should mimic the big server. But the problem with this is shortest remaining size doesn't pack well. So you can end up with servers that are idle when you're doing shortest remaining size because you're just not getting a good packing. So anybody, what should we do? Hint, it's related to the beginning of the talk. Okay, we want to combine shortest remaining size, but at the same time, we want to keep the servers full. So we want to do server filling. We want to do server filling with SRPT. Okay, so the idea here is I'm going to take the jobs and I am going to actually sort them by size. So from smallest to biggest. So here on the left, I'm going to sort my jobs based on their size. Let's suppose this is their size, okay? Remember size has, has in it both the server need and duration. And let's suppose this is the size, okay? But now in order to keep the servers utilized, I'm gonna define an M set. M set's gonna be the same thing, the minimum prefix that together encompasses at least K servers. And then within the M set, I'm gonna pack largest server need first. And this is gonna allow me to attain the full stability region. And furthermore, I'm gonna still be favoring jobs with smallest remaining size, because essentially I'm still keeping them in that size order, okay? I'm not, I'm not changing that. So by doing both these things, using the M set, but still basically keeping things ordered in size order, we're able to attain this theorem that we want to attain here. So I'm gonna give you just a very, very quick sketch of some of the issues in proving this theorem, very quick, okay? So when you're trying to prove a theorem about scheduling, okay, especially SRPT scheduling, um, if you ever get my book, you will see, I talk about this a lot, okay? Scheduling policies. What you do is you say to yourself, suppose I'm a job of size X, and I plop the job of size X here according to its size. So maybe the job is like pretty big here, whatever, okay? And then you ask, what is the work that job X experiences? What is the relevant work relevant to this job X? So what we would like to say is here we have some amount of relevant work, which is the work that will get done that, that 
is relevant to X. It's work made up of jobs that are smaller than X. And here we have relevant work. And what we would like to say somehow is that the relevant work is similar. And if we said that the relevant work is similar for a job of size X, then we might somehow be able to say that the response time experienced by a job of size X is similar in the two systems. And if we could do that, then we might be able to say that the mean response time of, is similar in the two systems. This is how these kind of arguments normally go. If you read our SRPT K paper, you know, it's this kind of an argument. The problem is, okay, for multi-server jobs, this middle term over here is false. So you could have a job that had really small size and on the right side, it would get done very fast. But on the left side, this job of really small size could unfortunately get stuck in the M set for a while while bigger jobs get to kind of go ahead of it. Okay, because in the M set, you're ordered by highest server need. So you can't really relate things on a per job basis. So instead, we use a different idea, which um, was really uh, coined by my student, Zeev Scully. Um, and this is called Wine. And it allows us to relate the relevant work to, of a job of size X to overall mean response time. So it allows us to just make this jump from here to here, okay? The only problem is that in order to use this wine relationship between relevant work, I need the difference here in the relevant work to be pretty small. And that brings us to the question of how different is the relevant work? And it turns out you might not be surprised at this point that this delta is related to relevant weight, <laughs> okay? So remember how we talked about systems doing waste? Here, what you need to do is you need to be thinking about the work made up of jobs of size less than X multiplied by the fraction of time that I'm not working on the jobs of size less than X. So here on the system on the right, whenever there's jobs of size less than X, I'm always busy working on them. But on the system on the left, there might be jobs of size less than X and I'm not always working on them. And I need to understand that friction. I need to understand what I'm doing one and not the other. Once we relate those things, we end up with a nice formula for mean response time in the, in the server filling system as compared to the SRPT system. And then it turns out that this last bit here is little o of the mean response time in an SRPT one. And putting all those things together, we have the theorem that we aim to prove. So I know I've very much rushed that last part, but I do want to show you what it looks like graphically. So here you saw server filling from before, and we said it was a great policy, and it looks very much like an MG1 first come first serve. If you look at server filling SRPT, whoops, if you look at server filling SRPT, it definitely looks better, okay? They both hit the full stability region, but server filling SRPT, you know, of course it requires way more preemptions, okay? Because you're preempting whenever jobs arrive and leave and whatever, but it, it does better than server filling if you wanted to do that. And then you might be wondering about that super server, okay? That, that big super server, SRPT1. Well, it's clearly even better, but when load gets high, they converge to the same thing, okay? So their ratio goes to one. So this is it for the third part of the talk about looking at heavy traffic optimal policy for, for um, multi-server systems. Um, I would like to just summarize and then maybe we can take a few more questions. So what I talked about here is a multi-server job. And I hope that everybody starts working on multi-server jobs. <laughs> okay, so these consist of a server need and a duration. And I started the talk by saying surprisingly little is known about multi-server jobs. Stability is hard to understand for multi-server systems. And response time is even harder to understand for multi-server jobs, okay? So um, there's really a lot of work to be done. In this talk, we introduced one policy server filling, which has some cute ideas that allow it to achieve the full stability region 
given common workload assumptions like these power of two. So, and by achieving that um, full stability region, we then were able to actually prove predictable response time, okay, for all loads. And then we talked about a variant of server filling, which achieves heavy traffic optimality, okay, but becomes less practical because of a lot of, a lot of um, preemption. So I consider this just the beginning. There are way more policies that we can analyze. And maybe now we can use some of these ideas to start to think about other policies. But I was asked um, at the end of my talk to talk about a few directions that young researchers might want to think about. So I prepared a slide with two more directions. So one direction is I know a lot of people are interested in scaling regimes. And again, this is all very, very new work, but there's been some very nice work that Wayna Wong um, at CMU, she's an assistant professor, um, has been leading on um, looking at multi-server systems through scaling regimes. And this is a very interesting stuff because normally when we think about scaling, we think about scaling the arrival rate and the number of servers, right? You think about doing those two things. But now we have three things we could scale. There's an arrival rate, there's a number of servers, but there's also the server need. And all sorts of counterintuitive things happen. Like we're used to this Halfenwick regime where we're used to if the load stays constant, okay, and you scale up the number of servers, then, you know, queuing should go down, response time should go down, everything should go down, like good stuff happens, right? In this type of a system, a multi-server system, that doesn't happen, okay, because of the server need. Okay, so weird things happen, and I think this can open up a whole nother area. Okay, a second direction that one can go into is a lot of computer science jobs today can actually be run on any number of cores. So it's not like a fixed server need. Um, this is very true of database jobs, which are jobs I work with a lot. So the jobs could be run on any number of cores and there's a speed up function and if you give the job more cores, it runs faster, but it, you know, gets depreciating benefit, okay? And now there's this question of what if you have many jobs arriving over time, and each one, you have to decide how many cores am I going to give you instead of the job requesting some number of cores. So this is work of my former student, Ben Berg, um, now at UNC, and I encourage you to look at his papers. And if you just want an overview paper that just talks about the overview of various problems, take a look at my paper called Open Problems in Queuing Theory Inspired by Data Center Computing. Um, this is also a pretty recent paper and kind of talks a lot about the space. So I feel like there's so much more to solve and I really would love to have people come join us in solving these things. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much more for this uh, great talk. Uh, we have you. about uh, five minutes, so uh, we have lots of time for questions. Surely people have questions. So there's a lot to see. Ruth. Uh, more thanks for the really great talks. Very, very interesting. So I was wondering, I think it's an implicit assumption, but I was wondering what happens in practice. When you have something, is it true that all of the cores need this, you need the same amount of time from each core to process a job? Is that somehow yeah. unstructured? Yeah this, is, up? Okay. yeah, this is very interesting. So I actually do um, a huge amount of work with Google. And um, so I told you I was working with our Borg data center, but I, I spend a lot of time talking to people at Google. And at Google, they really are dealing, all their jobs, okay, that they have, that they're running in the cloud are what I defined as a multi-server job. So the job holds on to, like the job comes in and it says, I need 256 cores. And then it holds on to it for some amount of time. And the people at Google, are super concerned with, is there any way, they're basically running like first come first serve, okay? Because that's what the world does. And they're very concerned with, is there any way of predicting the response time? 
So let me just jump back to this picture here. Okay, so this kind of picture where they'd like to understand what is the response time for first come first serve, okay? Or maybe a slight backfilling version of first come first serve or something. They would like to understand what is the response time that you can tell us. And unfortunately, in these kinds of systems, we don't know the response time. So I am basically spend time coming up with heuristics for them on like how we can kind of heuristically approximately tell you something about the response time and prove some response time bounds. And that work led to thinking, wait a minute, can we ever actually derive response time? And, um, and, and that led to the work that I presented. That's great. I guess you could have virtual queues where you put jobs in, in a queue according to how many cores they need. That's like a class classification. Is, does that help? Yeah. So, so that kind of thing actually happens in supercomputing centers. So I was okay. saying that back in 1996, all my jobs ran on a single core, but that was at Berkeley, okay? In supercomputing centers, Throughout time, as I'm sure you know, being San Diego supercomputing near the San Diego supercomputing centers, in supercomputing centers throughout time, jobs have come in and said, I need a certain number of cores and I need them for, in the supercomputing centers, they even state that you must tell them how long an upper bound on the duration of the jobs. And, um, and so this has been going on for a very long time. And they, at the supercomputing centers, they actually keep them on separate queues. So they say the jobs that need 256 cores go on one queue, the job that need 512 cores go on the next queue, jobs, you know, so they keep them in separate queues. And they actually try to do something similar to like a most servers first. Mm -hmm. so they try to pack in jobs that are what they call the big jobs that need a lot of servers. And they try mm -hmm. to pack those in first, first because they think that they get a better packing, but also they feel like those jobs somehow count more and are more important. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't worry about response time. So they don't worry about the fact that they're hurting response time by doing it. Okay. All right, uh, it's fascinating, thank you. Great questions. Anybody else have any questions? These are like fantastic questions. You can always send me email. You can always find me, send the email. Um, so I, so more yeah, I have a question. So the, this kind of, um, in data centers, for example, if they're doing like massively, very massively parallel jobs, uh, a job is not like a, it's a task of a larger job. Um, and here, if I'm understanding you correctly, here you're, you're not thinking about that kind of context, right? Here no, I'm thinking about jobs. the I'm thinking about like the jobs that I deal with at Google that come in and they say, I need this many servers and maybe like I need this many cores. And the reason that they're asking for those cores is often because there are large machine learning jobs where the, the, it's a machine learning job that's going to run on these many, many cores. And it's gonna run like a neural net on these many, many cores. So it's gonna hold on to the cores and utilize them. The job itself, by the way, may not, and this goes back to Ruth's question, there may be periods of time where the job is not actually utilizing all the cores that it requested, but it requested that many cores. Right. And a lot of the time it is utilizing all those cores and then some of the time it might not be utilizing them. But the job itself is spans the many cores and holds on to them. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's sense. a lot more to say about these kinds of models. So um, so like I said here on this last slide, um, the work that my student Ben did was on jobs that are like more flexible in terms of how many cores you give them. So that's a second line of work. And we're actually working on a third line of work, which is jobs um, so database jobs, it turns out, they have these phases and they might alternate between a phase where they're what's called embarrassingly parallel mm -hmm. or like fully elastic, they can use all the cores or phases where they're doing like a join or something where right, they right. basically become sequential. Uh -huh. And then you're alternating between like a very paralyzable point and a sequential point and then a very paralyzable phase and then a sequential phase. 
And we're looking at how do you schedule jobs that look like that? Right. Okay. Basically, I'm always motivated by the jobs that I see. But as far as I can tell, all the jobs use multiple cores. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's that's a common theme. And and so we we really, instead of thinking about an MGK, which I know is already really hard, okay, we really need to be thinking about a multi-server version of an MGK. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot more. Unfortunately, we're out of time, uh, but thanks uh, for this inspiring talk. And thank you everyone for being here and hope to see you at the next SNAP seminar. Thank you. Hi, Alan. <laughs> Hi, more.